which is about uh, Japan, uh, EU relations under the presidency of uh, Irish presidency of the Council of European Union. Could I get on first to the slide. first slides? Yes. And I hope my slides will not be so temperamental <laughs> as uh, Sayuri's. <laughs> if that goes on. Oh, this is way. Okay. Great. Uh, here. Um, uh, oh, by the way, uh, the Irish presidency, this is great. Uh, because one of the things I admire about the European Union is that that each member state have equal opportunity to run the huge vehicle. You, got, uh, you had Cyprus driver, and now you've got Irish driver. This is great. It never happens in the United Nations or the World Bank. So it's amazing. OK, so let me start with introducing a small booklet, which is about your guide to Lisbon Treaty. You can find it everywhere in Brussels in the EU Information Center. It starts with this line. After decades of war that cost millions of lives, the foundation of the European Union marked the beginning of a new era where European countries solved their problems by talking, not by fighting. This is an amazing phrase. It sounds simple, but it's one of the hardest things in human beings. Fighting is still everywhere in the world, in the Middle East and Africa. So having this in mind, uh, let me start uh, talking about Japan U. Uh, relationship in terms of development cooperation. And before that, let me start uh, by looking at uh, yeah, the impact of financial crisis on EU aid. This is interesting because I talk, when I talked to my, this subject to my former boss, Sadako Gata, she told me, you are the only Japanese who worries about the impact of uh, financial crisis on aid. Everybody's worrying about banking and financial system in Japan, but I'm the only one who really cares about the impact of financial crisis of EU aid or EU development cooperation. Uh, but interesting enough, the mainstream politicians such as Angela Merkel of Germany already said that we should complete an economic and monetary union and build a political union step by step, even at this uh, political at this hardest time. And I met with a number of uh, EU politicians, parliamentarians, who also said that the current crisis may offer an opportunity to further unite Europe. But nonetheless, it is true, however, that the current uh, financial crisis is posing a dark cloud, casting the dark cloud across Europe. Southern Europeans, Spanish, Italians, Greeks, are frustrated by the austerity measures of their own government. And on the other, other hand, Northern Europeans, Dutch, uh, British, and German, I don't know about <laughs> Irish, Dutch, British, Nord Nordics, are getting angry to know that more and more of the tax money is being spent to rescue the debt-ridden uh, southern neighbors. But Commissioner President Barroso made a very nice remark at a speech delivered at the State of Europe last October, which was organized by Friends of Europe, to which I also belong. He mentioned two demons, the Barroso's two demons. It, those icons doesn't look horrible. They're Japanese demons. Mm -hmm. And during the Cold War days, uh, there was a, a West-East division, as you know. And, but Europeans has, uh, has got rid of <coughs> this demon by helping Germany to reunite their divided territories and welcoming most of the East Bloc countries as a full-fledged member of the European Union. So that has been done. And currently, uh, you are face faced with the second demon, which is North-South divide. But I'm confident, as Mr. Barroso, <coughs> that Europeans will finally solve this divide with your wisdom and sense of solidarity. But uh, there's a Japanese saying which says, after the rain, the, solid becomes, uh, the, the soil becomes more solid. There's a Japanese saying. But yes, after the rain, there's a good news, which is a good news about EU development uh, cooperation. There's no, I haven't seen any demons in the EU development cooperation, you know, development cooperation. If you look at the budget, as Michael mentioned earlier, uh, at the European Council on April 8, 
February 8 and 9, uh, heads of uh, member states uh, battled uh, through the multi-annual financial framework over sleep, through a sleepless night, and they reached the conclusion to slash the budget, uh, EU budget for the new uh, term, which starts in 2000, from 2014 to 20 by 34 billion euros against the proposal, uh, Van Rompuy's proposal of 994 billion. But fortunately, uh, the budget under heading four, which is global euro budget, including development cooperation, increased by 3.3% over the previous framework. 3.3% it's not a bad figure, given the austerity situation across Europe. So I really, really uh, glad to hear, hear that. I'm not talking about other issues like agriculture, but as far as development aid is concerned, you has done a good job. Your heads of state has done a good job. And what is more encouraging is the fact that, uh, according to the opinion poll conducted by the Commission, it said, it showed that 85% of European citizens said it is either very important or important to help developing countries. This is amazing. This is the highest ever figure supporting development cooperation in any developed country, any developed country. So amazing Europeans. I'm very, very glad to hear the results of opinion poll. Now, let me take a moment to think about the concept, the change of concept of development in the 21st century with comparison to that of uh, Cold War days, which is in 20th century. During the Cold War, the Western governments, including, including Japan, focused to bolster aid to bolster the regimes of the capitalist bloc <coughs> countries. So, I mean, political and economic regimes of the capitalist countries without, so they didn't so much care about the governance and human security and human rights of the country they were working for, because the primary objective is to bolster the existing regime of the country. But things have changed dramatically after the Cold War because national, ethnic, and religious conflicts everywhere they emerged, everywhere. So development must be linked to security, peace, and state building. So the challenge has become so daunting for the development community compared with, with the days on the Cold War days. So now the donors have has to contribute, concentrate their effort, not on purely on development, but on various other factors surrounding <laughs> development, which is security, governance, human rights, democracy, and everything. So, so in a sense, if there's no security, there's no development. If there's no development, there's no security. This is a paradigm of development community in the current, uh, current uh, days. So uh, for example, Iraq and Afghanistan are a case in point, and Syria and Mali will be the next, our next challenges. Okay, uh, now let me turn to the potential of the European Union for more global Europe, or more re-emergence of Europe. The re-emergence of Europe was mentioned at the Davos, Davos uh, summit. Uh, this, in, this is a very, very good word, re-emergence of Europe, or global Europe. Here, I, uh, in terms of EU institutions, the Lisbon Treaty has dramatically changed them to better serve such global <coughs> demands for development. In terms of EU potential for external actions, I would highly evaluate uh, the creation of European External Action Service, EEAS, and the High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, which, who oversees EES currently, uh, Catherine Ashton. EES, uh, which functions uh, as a foreign ministry of the European Union, so to speak, it's still at the early stage of its operation. It was created only in 20, 20, 2009. 
It's still new. But uh, as far as I observe in Brussels, they are doing very well and very good, very well and very hard in order to ensure that the common security and foreign policy be implemented across the whole EU external action. So in development, for example, we got the huge uh, bureaucracy, which is DG DECA, which is Development uh, and Cooperation Directorate. And we got, uh, you got ECHO, which is humanitarian, EU Humanitarian Aid and Civil Protection Directorate. So in terms of you know, linking the EU foreign policy with development policy, EES is working so hard to coordinate with De DEPCO because most of the budget instruments are controlled by De DEPCO, so EU has to work together with EFCO. So in a way, particularly in the area where security and development must be linked together, EES has strong security apparatus within its institution, and they also look at political affairs of the foreign country. So they are in the position, central position, to link development and security and political affairs under one roof. And also, in terms of uh, emergency assistance, Michael mentioned the linkage between emergency aid and long-term development aid. So EU is in a position trying to sequence uh, emergency assistance with the long-term uh, development assistance. So the role of EES, I would say, is very important, crucial. They have done a good job already in Syria and Mali, for example, and such a thing has never happened before they were created as a result of Lisbon Treaty. So, Lisbon Treaty is a very good benchmark for further uniting Europe as a global power. Now, after that, okay. <coughs> this is the final slide. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the Japan as a, as a potential for Japan and EU collaboration as a partner for more global Europe. Japan could be an essential partner for European Union if European Union want to exercise <laughs> more global uh, influence in the current complex, complex uh, society, uh, international society. As Michael mentioned, the EU development cooperation is it's huge. The combined ODA provided by the member states with, uh, with that of the Commission totals 53.1 billion euros in 2011, so which accounted for nearly 60% of the global ODA. United States, 25%. Japan, nearly 10%. So if EU joined up with Japan, that will be a huge impact in the development community in the world, provided that EU should speak in one voice. If EU aid is fragmented in by 27 member states, then there, will, there won't be a, a strong influence on the global community. If EU is, aid is more coordinated with, under the Commission's coordination uh, capacity, then it will be a tremendous impact. But by the way, the, according to the Article 4 of the Treaty of U Functioning of the European Union, the development cooperation and humanitarian Humanitarian aid is area where shared competency are secure. So traditionally, uh, EU member states can give their own aid and commission uh, implement their own aid as part of the European Union. So it's a little bit complicated, but if uh, that is united together, there will be a huge uh, impact on that. Um, one of the things I notice is so more coordination and more comprehensive and more impact. That will be the keywords for European Union aid in the coming uh, Irish presidency. So one of the things which I notice, I mean, I recognize here is where I got here. This is the Council conclusions uh, adopted in May 14, 2012, last year. It is about increasing the impact of EU development policy, uh, which is called Agenda for Change. This is a short paper, but four-page paper, but it, it says a very important uh, things about uniting European aid. It says, 
that the EU and the member states have a joint responsibility to reduce aid fragmentation, improve coordination, and deliver concrete development results effectively and efficiently by making concrete progress on joint multi-annual program here. Joint multi-annual aid programming, I think, is a very, will be potentially, it's a very strong vehicle or driver to unite EU, fragmented EU aid in one house. It works like this. Traditionally, every member state and commission used to make their own uh, document, uh, which is called aid programming document, by country, by all country they serve. So in a, in a sense, there were lots of duplication. The same things, similar documents have been formulated by different member states. So joint programming exercise is to produce just one document, a program document for one country, for all EU member states. This, I think, is a great, great step forward in terms of coordinating aid. Oh, by the way, in current year, uh, joint programming is already going on uh, in a number of uh, uh, pilot countries like Ghana, Rwanda, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Guatemala, Laos. And JICA has already joined the discussion as an observer in, uh, in Rwanda and Laos. But basically, joint programming is for the EU member states, but it is open to other uh, donors like Japan and the United States. And the United States has already, USAID had shown interest. I met, when I met with the representative USA in Brussels a couple of uh, weeks ago, she, she was very much interested to join Japan in uh, some of the exercise in joint programming. So if EU, Japan, US is involved, that will be a huge impact on the development of the partner countries. So here again, this is the area where the role of external action service, EEA, is critical. They are the one who can coordinate a different EU institutions, DEPCO, ECHO, and other institutions in terms of coordinating their activities in the particular countries. So you've got uh, uh, currency union, now you've got banking union, so why not aid union? That is my <laughs> point. Okay, lastly, uh, I'm talking about Japan. Let me say a few things about Japan and e where Japan and EU can work together uh, for a more stable and resilient world. Uh, I mentioned earlier the stability of the world. For the stability of the world, we need to link development with security. This is absolutely necessary. Without security, no development. Without development, no security. Okay. And for a resilient world, as Michael mentioned, we really need to bridge the emergency aid with development assistance. And Japan has an ample experience and knowledge on the fields of uh, disaster prevention. So we're really uh, keen to share our knowledge on disaster resilience with many countries in Asia and Africa. And this has been our uh, two uh, major uh, themes to work where we can work together with Europe, linking development with security and building resilient society. So these two themes is going to be a very important issues, not only for Ireland, but also for Japan and uh, uh, European Union. So finally, I just want to you know, emphasize the role of EU institutions and strengthening EU, strong EU institutions to work together uh, with other uh, development agencies such as JICA. And this will be a very, very good news, not only to EU member states, but also to other major uh, international donors on development. So uh, EES, DG DEPCO and DG ECHO, are the th are th these are the three important external action instruments of the EU European Union, and Japan will be better a partner to work with Europe if they are supposed they are working together under one voice and in a more coordinated way. So lastly, I think European Europeans must uh, has got to remember 
that Japan and the world needs more and more global Europe at the time when America is getting less and less global. Thank you very much. Thank you.